Hi there, friends. This is Aaron. This is Tom. With a brand new episode of our cute and flirty podcast. This is this is not a flirty podcast. <laughs> Why not? I mean, it just has. I mean, historically, it has not been. It's just cute and flirty. I guess. Um, baby's first watch list. That's what it's called. Who knows? This could be our last before baby recording. Yeah, uh, we. <laughs> It was possible the other day, but uh, <laughs> well, here we are. Listen, all I know is that I have a pup's diagnosis. Which, look that up. We don't need to talk about that. Yeah. Basically, I have rashes that look like chewed up raw meat all over my body, and it won't go away until delivery or after. And I've been spending all of our money on a million things to try and help, including something that's called Grandpa's Pine Tar Soap. It smells like... It smells like a burning cigar, which for some people is fine. I actually don't mind it, but so, I don't expect my wife to smell like a burning cigar. Pups Reddit, if you uh, ever go down that rabbit hole. All my hole, pup heads. <laughs> all the pup heads out there, they uh, suggest standing in cold water in a shower and then lathering yourself with grandpa's pine tar soap, which costs like $6.97 on Amazon. And you have to stand there with the soap on you for 15 minutes. So, and it hasn't worked. Nothing's worked. So here we are. Yeah, I don't know why we're... <laughs> we're it's, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> to get my mind off the incessant need to scratch myself into oblivion, we are here today to talk about 2010's teen comedy, Easy A. Tom, what do you remember about 2010? <laughs> uh, well, that was the year that you and I both graduated high school. That's right. We didn't know each other Until then. later in 2010. Yes. Um... I remember Toy Story 3. Yeah. Uh, I remember seeing that with my friends, which we talked about in the first episode we of did. Toy Story. Go back and listen to it if you can stand the audio quality. Um, what else happened in 2010? I don't know. That was the first time I drank alcohol. Oh, my God. You can't say that. Our kid's going to listen to this. Why? I was 18. Oh, my God. This isn't 1975. <laughs> <laughs> the, the drinking age is 21. Yeah. Oh, my God. I did not drink till I was 21 years old, and that's not a lie. No, that's really not a lie. It's really not a lie. Um, well, this actually was released in September 2010. I didn't see this in 2010. I think I did. I think I did. I think I saw it back when it came out because I remember being obsessed with it. I loved it. It seemed movie. like 2010 news, like, perfect movie. Absolutely. Yes. I love DZA. And... By the time it came out, you and I did know each other. Uh, freshman yeah. year of college. Yeah. For a few weeks. For a couple weeks, yeah. So this movie, directed by Will Gluck, stars a young Emma Stone in a Gl Golden Globe-nominated role as protagonist Olive Pendergast. I didn't look it up, but I am 99% sure this was her first Golden Globe nomination. Certainly not her last. Emma Stone, as we know, is an Oscar winner. Hopefully you know that too. I don't know why you wouldn't. Are you and talking, she's, talking to me? No, like the oh. people listening. Oh. I don't know. Maybe you don't, you're not a, a stonehead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, she's won, she's won an Oscar for La La Land. She's nominated constantly for, for big awards. Uh, but this was like her first kind of breakout role. She was in things like The House Bunny. I believe she won a Partridge Family contest what yeah i think she was in like a partridge family singing competition for like a remake of it sort of thing man yeah so the singing is really her in yeah. this uh so this was her big well, breakout role though well oh zombie land she was in zombie, she was land, in zombie land right before this, right she, before was this. In, and she was in super bad a couple years before this you're right she was but so this was her first starring role this was her first starring role and it was the first one where i think people really took a lot of yeah. notice of her yeah because in the other one she was like a good supporting character that people like i loved her in zombie land um mm -hmm. but um this was the one where people were really like okay she's legit she's a star That's and exactly then crazy right. stupid love was the next year you're exactly right too. a lot of the uh reviews for this movie pinpointed this is like this girl's going to be huge and then she was in the help the following year too which yeah. which she then got was nominations now like a big and stuff like mega that, yeah. star after that so so easy a to me is considered a teen movie classic uh it made 75 million dollars on a meager eight million dollar budget which is a very impressive small budget to me considering the pedigree of its cast yeah first of all it has max crumb who was a oh, winner yeah. 
of the NBC reality competition show, Grease, You're the One That I Want. Anybody see that? No, Tom, you didn't see that? <laughs> so I watched it. <laughs> I watched it back in like 2008. And it was like, a, there was a, a, a winner who was the Danny winner and there was a Sandy winner. And then they were the leads in the reboot of Grease on Broadway. And it did not do very well. But do you have any other stats on it? I do. Actually, the okay. winner, Sandy, is Laura Osnes. I think that's how you pronounce her name. She had a lot of controversy recently because she is strongly anti-vax. OK. So, yeah, she's she was she's actually still a big Broadway person. She was uh, Cinderella and she was in Bonnie and Clyde and stuff like that. But, yeah, she uh, there's some issues there. Yeah, quite uh, <laughs> sounds like it. Max Crumb, I mean, he, you know. Listen, if there's any Crumb heads out there, let us know. <laughs> okay, uh, I, you know, I'm joking. I'm not joking. He actually did win. Grease, you're the one that I won. <laughs> This is the this is the worst this is this is the worst podcast that's ever no, been. No, I love it. Um but there's a few other actors with longer resumes than than Crumb. Um so besides <laughs> besides Emma Stone, we've got Patricia Clarkson, we have Stanley Tucci, Thomas Hayden Church. Uh, there's a Lisa Kudrow appearance, a Fred Armisen cameo, Malcolm McDowell's even in it. We got Amanda Bynes. Uh, we have Penn Badgley of Gossip Girl and You fame. He's like had a big career renaissance already. Uh, Ali Mashaka from Phil of the Future fame. But Tom, you know her from what? Ali and AJ. Yeah, her and her sister's band. We have uh, Dan Bird. Who played the best friend in the Cinderella story? Hillary Duff Hive, stand up. Uh, okay. Duff heads? <laughs> Duff heads. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop with that. And now. we've got um Cam Gionde, which I would always thought was pronounced Giginde. It's not. I had okay. to go like look it up on YouTube. Uh, who you may know from the awful Twilight series or the even more awful burlesque. Okay. Yeah. So you know, it gets a little jokey at the end there with all those people. But the first few names are serious star power for a movie that was made for not much money. Yeah. I was like really surprised rewatching it here. I knew everybody that was in it. But when you really think about their pedigrees, it, it's wild that all yeah. these people are in this movie. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's not like it was like Lisa Kudrow before Friends or like the, all these people were mega famous at the time already. Mega famous. Patricia Clarkson, I feel, has like... Re and Stanley Tucci, both of them yeah. have really stepped it up a notch in the past decade. Yeah. Uh, but even they were very famous back then, too. Yeah. So Notable names, for sure. Very notable. Besides Emma Stone's Golden Globe nomination, Easy A snagged some love from the Teen Choice Awards, the MTV Movie Awards. But, you know, besides those, they it has proven to have some staying power. It was named number 14 on Entertainment Weekly's Best High School Movies list. I'm going to give you two guesses on what number one was. Breakfast Club. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've never even seen The Breakfast Club. Oh, my Club. God. Well, Breakfast Club is actually the only one out of the top three that I have seen. Can you uh, round out the top three? We've got Breakfast Club. And then what are the other two? Um, say Anything. Is that a high school movie? That is a high school movie that is not in the top three. But um, it is referenced a ton in Easy A. Days and Confused? Days and Confused is number three. Think of that vibe for number two. Give me a hint for number two. I haven't seen it. It's from the 80s, but it's not like John Hughes 80s. Hmm. Because I was going to, my other guess would have been Ferris Bueller. Think of, okay, here's the thing. Matthew McConaughey was the big breakout of Dazed and Confused. Yeah. There is someone who was a big breakout from this movie that played like the jokey character that then like later on won a billion Oscars and is kind of like weird looking and dated Madonna. And <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Oh, okay. So yeah. I'm thinking Sean that is, Penn. That is, the that is Dazed and Confused uh, down that road. Right? I, I mean, I haven't seen either one. No, it, I mean, it, I haven't seen Fast Times, but it's in my head I would associate the two. I can't wait to see both of those. Days and Confused is awesome. Yeah, I know. Well, 
Richard Linklater, baby. Yeah. Uh, Episode so, two, School of Rock, out now. <laughs> so yes, you got it right immediately, The Breakfast Club. I was not even close. I was like, what is number one? I had to go find the list, scroll all the way. But you're right, it was The Breakfast Club. But Easy A, 14. That's pretty darn good. Um, and this list was out of 50. I can't wait to go back and uh, look at the list because I just scrolled to see what number one, two, and three were. I saw this. Like I mentioned, right after high school, while a freshman at college, I adored this movie. I had major hair envy uh, of Emma Stone's. And Tom, I don't know if you remember this, but I did remember this because I never had the confidence to do this. My body type just won't allow it. But Olive Pendergast was a major Halloween costume when we were in college. I don't remember that. Yeah. A lot of people wore like the black corset with the black leather leggings and the A on the chest. Like at college? Like in college. I don't remember that. I did not do that. I once dressed as white trash for college. Okay. But I did not have the uh, the body confidence to dress as Olive Pendergast. It just wasn't going to happen. But it was a very popular costume. Interesting. Yeah. Would have had no clue. Right? So, Tom, that's all I got for you for this. I went a little off the board this oh, time. This time. <laughs> so give me that summary, making sure that it's as um, baby appropriate as possible. Because, the you know, it can get a little, it's PG-13, but yeah. it's a little, you know. I will tell you that there's no expletives in my uh, plot summary. That's something. So we open with 17-year-old Olive Pendergast, who is played by Emma Stone, as we talked about. She's talking into her webcam. Which is very uh, before its time, kind of. Yeah. Uh, the webcam kind of serves as the framing device for the movie. So she is telling her audience uh, basically a big story about this lie that she was sort of tricked into making in a way. Uh, so she describes how at her Ojai, California high school, she lied to her best friend Rhiannon, played by Ali Michalka, about going on a date the prior weekend. But the reason she did that was to be able to say no to going camping with Rhiannon's nudist parents. So instead, Olive blasted Pocket Full of Sunshine by Natasha Bedingfield all weekend from a musical greeting card that her grandmother gave her. <laughs> Along with $5? <laughs> yes. But Olive does more than just lie about going on a date. Rhiannon pressures her into, quote unquote, telling her the truth, which Rhiannon hints is that Olive lost her virginity that weekend. Olive eventually, quote unquote, admits this. And Marianne, who is also in the bathroom with them, played by Amanda Bynes, overhears her. Marianne is a devout evangelical Christian. And as you would expect, she is appalled by Olive's quote unquote admission and she spreads Olive's unknown lie throughout the school. So as this is going on, uh, Olive tells her friend Brandon, who is gay, uh, the truth. And Brandon, who is tired of kind of being bullied around, suggests that Olive pretends to sleep with him at a high school party so that everyone believes he's straight. It's really sad. It is sad. Following a fight with Rhiannon in an English lesson on Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter from her teacher, Mr. Griffith, played by Thomas Hayden Church, King. Olive starts dressing more provocatively and stitching a red A onto all of her clothes, just like Hester Prynne. Boys all throughout the school beg Olive to allow them to say they slept with her in order to become more popular, and she agrees in exchange for gift cards. <laughs> this comes to a head when Micah, Marianne's boyfriend, finds out that he has chlamydia. It turns out that he got it from Mrs. Griffith, played by Lisa Kudrow, the guidance counselor and wife of Mr. Griffith. Much like Hester Prynne in The Scarlet Letter, Olive quietly accepts her reputational scar in order to save the Griffith's marriage. Rhiannon's crush, Anson, asks Olive out on a date and they go to the lobster shack, where he tries to coerce her into actually sleeping with him and Olive tells him off and ends the date. So this is the last straw for Olive. She explains the entire situation to her former crush, Woodchuck Todd, the school mascot played by Penn Badgley. Maybe not so former, though. Well, yeah, it's sort of hinted, not even really hinted throughout the movie, but they were like... They still like yeah. each other. Todd belie believes Olive's story because she once lied for him years ago by letting him say he kissed her during a Seven Minutes in Heaven game, even though nothing happened. So cute. That's about where the support stops, though. Olive tries to get the guys she lied for to help her out and tell the truth, but she's rebuffed because they're all popular now and they want nothing to do with that. They don't want they want nothing to do with their old life. Mrs. Griffith also refuses to come clean, and she tells Olive that no one will believe her story. So Olive puts that to the test by telling Mr. Griffith about his wife's affair. They separate. So I guess she was wrong. Uh Finally, Olive and her mother, Patricia Clarkson, hatch a plan. At a school pep rally, Olive gives a performance to advertise her provocative webcast that night, which she says will also feature Todd. As she's finishing up the webcast, which, as I noted, is the framing device for the entire movie, 
Todd Blast's Don't You Forget About Me by Simple Minds from the Lawnmower Outside, best known from The Breakfast, Breakfast Club, Club, which I, again, I have not seen. She explains to the camera that at some point she may lose her virginity to Todd, but no one's going to know about it because it's none of, none of their business. That's right. Olive apologizes to Rhiannon via text, meets Todd on the lawnmower as they kiss and ride off. The end. Happily ever after. That's so cute. But you didn't talk about Stanley Tucci at all. I know. I knew that when I was writing it. <laughs> he's he's jokey. He's very jokey, but he's not a big part of the plot. He's not. No, but the scene with him. Wait, I, I, I'm going to skip to the I'm going to skip to one of my questions. because oh, It's okay. not really a question. OK. Do you know what the Pendergast names are? Olive. Yes. I actually don't know the other names. Okay, I Mr. Look- and Mrs. and then the no, brother? <laughs> no, I, I looked them up. I looked them up and it's the most California name. Like All right. Rosemary is okay. Patricia Clarkson. Yeah. Dill is Stanley Tucci. I did know that. Yeah. Her younger adopted brother is Chip and her unseen older brother is Kale. Oh my God. So their Wait, names are all- Rosemary, Dill, Kale, Olive, and Chip. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> Wow, I did not know that, actually. Yeah. I think I did hear Dill at one point. Yeah. No, do you know what it was? It was the closed captioning. And I was like, Dill? Yeah, because so- it was D-I-L-L. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's awesome. Do you know it took me so long, like, into adulthood, and I just was thinking it one day, that Dill Pickles, you know, like yeah. Tommy Pickles, oh, yeah. I did not catch that as yeah. a kid. Yeah, in the new remake, there's a half sour also. Oh, my gosh. Is there really? No. Oh, what? my God. <laughs> oh no um so <laughs> that was a really good summary overall you did a really nice job this was with a con- that. this was a concise one. very concise it usually takes you like 15 minutes well Not we've really. been talking about we've been talking about three-part fables and <laughs> that is very true easy i has a more simple plot although i would make the argument that the movie is much more than what that plot would absolutely have you, say, you, you you've know? Pro- you've probably seen it dear listener so. I would say so. I now that I'm looking back, I don't know. It's not a. I mean, it's, it's not, not like, like a, to, a ubiquitous. It's, it's not Toy, Toy Story or School of Rock. Yeah, but you probably have seen this movie, or you've at least heard of it and, and know of it, and you had your chance to see it because it was 12 years old. But exactly. Well, I have a good discussion point that I was thinking of as the movie was going on. Which is, this is one of those adapted from a classic literature thing into a teen movie movies. Um, Can you think of any others? I wrote down a few. I was just about to ask you what the others were. Okay. You really can't think of any? Not off the top of my head. So the big one, Clueless, adapted from Emma, which is a Jane Austen uh, book. Right. Um, We have She's the Man. Okay. Which is a Shakespearean (laughs) Twelfth Night uh, adaptation, also starring Amanda Bynes. We have 10 Things I Hate About You, which is Taming of the Shrew. Okay. Which I actually read my sophomore year. I did not love it. I actually saw a uh, an adaptation of Taming of the Shrew in London. That was okay. Oh, wow. Because I'm fancy like that. Yeah. But 10 Things I Hate About You is a great movie. You haven't seen that, have no, you? No, I have not actually. Um, what you, year was that? It's either late 90s or early 2000s. My guess would be 2000s. My guess would be 90s because it's not on our list. It's not on our list. Not on our 2000s <gasps> list. It should be. Which makes me think it's from it's the 90s. 90s. Yeah. Heath Ledger. So good. Oh, that cast rocks too. It's like Julia Stiles, who I don't love, but that's okay. Whoa. I know. I know. I know you like Are her you from Dexter. No, I don't like her. I actually hated that season of Dexter. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, From, no, Save the Last Dance. Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm, <laughs> that's I'm talking. That's a great movie. I'm talking Save the Last Dance. I love Save the Last Dance. <laughs> uh, 10 Things I Hate About You is 1999. Okay. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's in it. Okay. Yeah. Not, not a big fan. Oh, yeah. I know you don't love him. I'd like him. Sorry, Joe. All right. Listening. Well, we'll watch it for Heath Ledger. How about that? That's fine. So, yeah, that's an adaptation of Shakespearean literature. Uh, and, and so this one is, um, of course, like you said, based on Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, classic. Which 1850. Everyone hated. I don't think I know anybody who liked it. I didn't get past the intro. Oh, the, the yeah. prologue. Is it called like the bathhouse or something? something. It's just a description something so of something. boring. Yeah. Uh, but it's the Scarlet Letter. We had the Scarlet Letter in my junior year uh, in my high school that we read. And I did read it. Barely anybody did, just like in Easy A, when Mr. Griffith says that Olive is one of the only couple kids who have read uh, the the novel. I read it. I did not like it. It sucks. It's just so boring. Very, very boring literature. And you know what? I will say this. 
I loved most of the books I read in high school, even like the curriculum, canonical, blah, blah, blah books. I liked most of them. I read all of them. Scarlet Letters, probably at the very bottom of my list. Yeah, uh, I didn't read it. I I wasn't like a, I don't read any any books because I'm cool kid, but like I didn't, I didn't read this one. And it was one of a lot that I didn't read, but this was one that I particularly look back on and I'm like, I have no inkling to even revisit it. No, none. none. Um, it's one of those where like you get the point, like everybody knows what this is about. You don't need to read it. You know, if you've heard of the Scarlet Letter, if you've heard anyone talk about it, if you again, if you were in class in in high school, you know what it is. You don't. Um, maybe there's maybe there's some letterheads out there. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> that's it. I mean, Hawthorne heads. It is Come what on. it is. Go with the alliteration. I guess. So letterheads a real thing though. Okay, it, it, I don't really know if I'm right on this, but Scarlet Letter five second recap. Hester Prynne, she's the protagonist. She has an affair with. Uh, is he's not a priest, is he? I think he is. He might be a priest or, or a pastor or something. A man of God in some way. And she gets pregnant. She has the baby Pearl, and uh, she is ostracized from the community. Now, does she die? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember. Does it matter? No, because Easy A is way better, and you can just watch that instead. And her death, if it happens, is definitely not the point. No, it's definitely not. It actually, there's a good point to it, which is you know, it's not really fair to uh, be ostracizing people for uh something that is uh, you know still considered a uh very taboo subject it's interesting yeah i i looked it up because i wanted to know whether she does die she dies like later it's she doesn't oh, okay. die in the in the like actual story the main narrative yeah. okay so yeah, there's a uh, meta moment in this movie, Easy A, where Olive says that teen movies always connect classic stories to whatever teenage angst is going on. And I think that that is a very great point that is made. It's very funny, very meta. How do you think this fits into that genre, Tom, of the classic literature adaptations? Do you think that it does a good job? Um, or do you prefer the ones that are kind of more... Uh, like cl uh, faithful adaptations. Think of like Baz Luhrmann's, uh, is it Boz or Baz? <laughs> well, Who knows? He's Australian, probably Baz. Okay. Uh, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet or his Great Gatsby adaptation. Do you prefer that or do you like the more creative modern takes? I, I think it, I think it depends. I think that this is a very, well done version of the Scarlet Letter in that it takes the lessons from the Scarlet Letter and puts them in a way more palatable medium. So uh, again, I'm not going to go back and read the Scarlet Letter, but I understand the Scarlet Letter be and in part because of how well Easy A like lays it out there and it's entertaining and it's good. And I think I'll, in, in a lot of cases, that's what works. But when you have something like, I actually did not see The Great Gatsby and I'm not a huge fan of the book, but when you have something like The Great Gatsby. I feel like that's something that people want to see on screen yeah. as The Great Gatsby. Sure. So I think it really comes down to what it is you're adapting. That's interesting because like Hamlet is like The Lion King and all right. these other things. But I was something recently too. Uh, I forget what movie we just saw in the past year that was obviously Hamlet. Oh, uh, crap. Right. Well, it's also Sons of Anarchy, which is not what we're talking about. Okay. But yeah. Um. But then it was something. That, it was the Northman. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Which was and Hamlet's based on the Norse mythology. Yes. yes. So it, it all you know. Hamlet it all comes actually. Out in the wash. Hamlet actually came from the mythological story that the Northman is based on. Okay, but we're like, oh, it's Hamlet. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's actually really interesting. A lot of Shakespearean uh, literature. The adaptations that are kind of more unique are really good. And I think that part of that is because Shakespeare, if you ever read him, uh, he did not put a lot of stage direction in his plays. So that was people, scholars, uh, they surmise that he did that so that it would be more easily adaptable in all different ways and that you would give uh the directors and creators of this uh these plays a little more leeway in what they can and can't do so i have seen i can you tell i was an english major yeah <laughs> 
And sorry if you hear April barking outside. But yeah. This is, oh, it just is what it is. It is what it is. So I've seen a lot of different adaptations of Shakespearean plays. I I did do a little uh, three week thing in college in London with British theater and. I saw three separate adaptations. I had a black box theater adaptation of uh, the Twelfth Night, or not the Twelfth Night, Twelfth Night, uh, which was really cool, very minimalist. Like I mentioned, I saw The Taming of the Shrew, which was a modern urban take, which was a little strange. And I saw an S&M version of Measure for Measure, in Stratford upon Avon. I don't even know what measure for measure is. It's a very, it's a very like third tier Shakespearean play. We also in Princeton saw uh, the Winter's Tale. Yes, we did. Yeah, and that was good. That's a good adaptation too. I get. I don't remember it, but I'm sure it was good. It was good. There was one part where snow came down. I remember being like, "Ooh!" But yeah, so Shakespearean works. I feel like translate really well to more modern takes. But you're right. There's some literature, like maybe The Great Gatsby, where you really want to follow what the story is. Yeah. Um, It's interesting because then you have stuff like Catcher in the Rye, which has never really been adapted to film. Yeah. I actually just read about that not too long ago. And I think it's basically because J.D. Salinger just didn't want it to be. I don't think it would be a very because, good well, well, like, well, I don't like Catcher in the Rye anyway, but. Well, part of the point of the book is like anti-consumerist and like anti all that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. he wouldn't want to sell it to like a big Hollywood studio or something. Yeah, but he's dead. Yeah, I know. So maybe his estate would, but. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe when it goes in the public domain. That's. Oh, yeah. Like Winnie the Pooh just yes. did. <laughs> yes. Uh, one one other thing too is I, I sort of equate it to to biopics. So like for mm. example, if you go back a couple of years, there was Bohemian Rhapsody, which oh, was the God. Freddie Mercury oh. biopic starring uh, Rami, Rami Malek, Malek, who won Best Actor, and there also was Rocket Man, which was the Elton John biopic uh, starring Taron Ed- Edgerton. Yep. And I much preferred Rocket Man. Same. I don't know if that's. I don't know what the general breakdown is in terms of like what people liked more, but um, I thought Rocket Man was better because when I watch something about Elton John, I am good with something that is almost like magical realism, little fantastical, yeah. And it like he kind of goes in and out of songs, and like it's like the per- the performances of music in Rocket Man are like very colorful and and like almost like you're almost like vignettes. Yeah. Uh, whereas everything in Bohemian Rhapsody is so by the beat. Very milk toast, which is yeah, so not. It's anti Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury. I know. Yeah. yeah I, t- I hated Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, I really did not like the that. The teeth? Movie. The teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Darling. <laughs> the teeth are iconic. The teeth are so bad. <laughs> Rami Malik's teeth in like his teeth. What are they? They're fake. Like yeah, dentures. Yeah. He looked fine in the second half. But in the first, the first half was unreal. So bad. Yes. So I totally agree with that. That's okay. Cool. So Easy A, I thought was an excellent adaptation to bring a more boring classic piece of literature to the mainstream in the 2010s, uh, which are, what are they called? Not the tens. Sure. The tens. Really? Yeah. Why not? Because it's the aughts for the 2000s and then it's the tens. Well, it's. Just not the zeros. Yeah. So it has to be the odds. Yeah, I guess. So in the tens. Um, okay. What I found interesting also is there's a lot of homages to classic teen movies. Yeah, see, I haven't seen a lot of them. So I caught like the big ones. All right, tell me. How many Ferris Bueller ones did you catch? Any? Uh, I caught three big ones. I actually didn't. I wasn't paying attention for Ferris Bueller. I love Ferris Bueller's Day So off. do I. It, 1986, John Hughes classic. It's one of my few five stars on Letterboxd. It's excellent movie. So I call it three major ones. You have the shower mohawk. Okay. She does a shower mohawk, yes, which yes. Ferris does as they're singing. Yes. She's singing pocket full of sunshine. Right, right, right. right? You have one part where she plays an instrument. And then she says the line, never had one lesson. Yes. Which is a famous yes. Ferris Bueller quote. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and then um, you have that random song, a la Ferris at the parade, mm-hmm. uh, where which is a more, you know, old school song that he sings at the parade in Chicago and Olive doing uh, Knock on Wood, which, listen, that is not my favorite part of the movie. I find it very hokey and yeah. 
kind of corny and, yeah. and whatever. But I get the reason why. Which part was that? When she does knock on wood with, at the pep rally. Oh, at the at pep the rally. End. Yeah, yeah, at the pep rally. Yeah. So those are some uh, homages to Ferris Bueller. There's also a very similar kind of musical performance in 10 Things I Hate About You uh, with Heath Ledger singing can't take my eyes off of you you know that yeah, song? Yeah, yeah yeah so he does that with like not from your version but i do know that song <laughs> uh he does that with like the school band that's great um oh and then there's one that i was like i wonder if this is a real homage to a classic teen movie but you know when olive is angrily making her new wardrobe and she's like, rah, 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 like yeah, making all those yeah. noises it reminded me so much of mean girls when regina george makes the new burn book entry right right and i'm wondering if that was done purposefully i wouldn't be surprised if it was because that especially by 2010 was already being quoted and it was already like sort of in the canon a big cultural phenomenon mean girls was yeah which we will definitely be doing an episode on mean girls eventually yeah. i love that movie um, so I thought that that was really cool. I caught those. Did you find any other ones? Oh, obviously. Well, there's the obvious one at the end. With Say with, Anything. And also with The Breakfast Club. Of course. Um, yeah, right. Both of them. Yeah, it was a it was a cross reference. Yes, that is true. Because he's outside the window blasting music, but the song is the song from Breakfast Club. <laughs> yes. And of course, in the movie, Olive mentions out loud all of the other teen movies there's like stills from those movies yeah in it. so it makes perfect it's sense meta. it makes perfect sense that the guy that she liked would be outside her window combining two teen movie iconic teen movie moments absolutely um no i wasn't i i probably should have been looking out for them more but i wasn't really i just really like the uh the more subtle uh, Ferris Bueller ones. The yeah. the Mohawk and the Never Had One Lesson, I think, yeah. are, are awesome. Yeah. All right. I have a couple other things, but I want you to give me something. What okay. do you got? A discussion point, a question? Um. So what did you think about the framing device with the webcam? I loved it. I thought that that was such a smart way to do it. Um, and it's so funny because you said she's a little bit before her time. Now people vlog everything, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, back in 2010, we didn't really have YouTube vlogs. Yeah. But... I found it to be a really great way to kind of set the story from Olive's perspective where she could kind of give in anything that was within her thoughts and feelings um, and it doesn't feel overwrought, doesn't feel yeah. out of place because we know that this is her telling her audience something. And it's more creative than just a like a like an omniscient narrator type situation. 110%. We're seeing that a lot more now with uh, the success of Fleabag. Right. Which, listen, Fleabag is, to me, season two of Fleabag is the perfect season of TV. But now I'm noticing a lot more wink, nudge, turn to the camera and talk kind yeah. of things. And it being done, breaking the fourth wall without any other context put in. Right. So like there's a new Dakota Johnson, uh, oh, a adaptation of a Jane Austen novel, Persuasion. And I have not read Persuasion. I've read some of Austen's other stuff, but I've never read Persuasion. And people are not happy about that kind of wink, nudge, fourth wall breaking flea yeah. bag vibe. Um, when you have the vlog in there, that gets rid of the kind of taking your your uh, yourself out of it and and it being a little bit too on the nose with the wink nudgy. I think it also it's not a direct uh, it's not a direct trope that came from this specific thing when you talk about persuasion and when you talk about movies like that. But Deadpool also blew that up. Oh yeah, totally. So I think it's just sort of one of those things that I just had to look it up because I was thinking it's not Marvel, like it's not the MCU, but it was something. It's Deadpool because ever since Deadpool did that, it's been a. I feel like it's been a lot more prevalent in 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 media. Deadpool's not Marvel. He is Marvel, but he's not the MCU. It's one of those. How come he's never things. been in any of those like Avengers movies? Because he's not in the MCU. Because he's owned by I think Fox. But it's still Marvel. I think when uh, Disney bought Fox, Deadpool was going to come over. But he so hasn't come confusing. over yet. Is that like Spider Man? But Spider Man's Spider Man. In... No, Spider Man was Sony. Oh my god, it's so confusing. It's because Disney didn't realize, or I don't know when it was made, but Disney didn't realize that Marvel and superhero movies were going to get this huge. Yeah. So they licensed off all their other, sure. like the the Sam Raimi Spider Man movies were all Sony. <laughs> I like so, those. <laughs> so like you know, yeah, nothing happened until everything blew up. So so 
Fox had the X-Men and Deadpool's part of like the X-Men crew. Got it. So they had all those movies and all that. I liked Deadpool. I liked the third, the fourth wall breaking in that. Um, but I I thought that. It works in some things it better works in than some others. Things better than those. And it would have worked in Easy A. Yeah. I think it totally would have. Um, but I like the way that it was framed. How about you? Well, yeah. I mean, the webcast becoming part of the ending was. So smart. Yeah, it was creative. It was different. I liked it a lot. Good. Any other questions you got? Because I got, I have a comment. Um, I have a comment too. Uh, I think I was happy to see that the most 2010 song of all time played in this movie and it's uh, Good Life by One Republic. <laughs> yeah, and a weird part in the movie too. Yeah, it's like the montage where she's, she's like... sad. Yeah, and she goes to the confessional and like there's no priest there. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a comment I had. Uh, another one I had was... Um, actually, I'll get to that later. But we can talk about food. Okay. Yeah. Can I first do my one little thing that I had? Yeah, go for it. So there's a quotation that is, I just feel like very representative of me and my personality. Maybe some of my adult personality was formed by EZA, but I thought that Emma Stone as an eighth grader saying what she said in this part was like, wow, that really is me for better or for worse. And it's where she says, don't worry, I'm not nearly as smart as I think I am. Is <laughs> eighth grader? Yeah, it's when she was doing the, uh, like the seven minutes of oh, heaven thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. And she said, don't worry, I'm not nearly as smart as I think I am. Right. And I feel like that represents me very well. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's pretty accurate. That's on brand <laughs> for exactly. sure. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that. All right. So let's talk about food. So I, this is a much better food movie than um, The Secret of Kells was, right. and uh, better also probably better than Pan's Labyrinth was, even though there was a lot in that movie. It was one scene. So we, I think we're going to finally hit our stride with this one. Well, this is because there is a very famous gif that at least I yeah. use, you know, relatively often that's connected to food. Which is not one of the, that's one of like seven food scenes in this movie. That is true. Um, Rhiannon's parents' house. We get the first one. Yes, they're eating a patchouli burger. Yes, and they're uh, so they say, "Oh yeah, you guys want dessert?" And they pass a a bong over the. Over they do that. Yes. So so that's that's uh, the nudist dinner. Yes. Um. Then when she says the t word to um. Yeah, which I didn't even know was like a bad word because it's like a British slang. You word. know what's funny about that? When she gets called into the principal's office, and the person who the person who's freaking out about it the most is Malcolm McDowell, yeah, who is British. Is British. Yeah. So that's pretty funny. That is funny. Um, but in yeah. that scene, she has to. They, her parents ask her to spell it out in P's using yes. P's, yeah, and she does that for them. Uh huh. Um, does the Quiznos guy count? I I would love that. So can you explain what the Quiznos reference is? Sure. At one point. There's a small mob of people, all of Marianne's like Christian group that that are very anti olive, very anti sex. I think Rhiannon is there too. Rhiannon is now there too, and uh, while they are fighting, yes, and they have all these olive burns kind of things. Uh, think which, like your Westboro Baptist Church stuff, exactly. And one of the people <laughs> in the bag is just a guy spitting a Quiznos sign. He's like. A advertising yeah for he's quiznos. like get your chicken sandwich at quiznos in the background <laughs> when you have all these other people with the signs that are like we hate you olive yeah you're gonna burn in hell yeah exactly i thought that was amazing <laughs> uh and then finally the the only other like really notable one i had was of course at the lobster shack yes the best part she orders this like lobster dinner and it's it's main lobster with crab and seafood stuffing See, which i don't know. even know what seafood stuffing what does that mean who knows i don't eat seafood so i'm a and, vegetarian and why did the lobster shack look like a fine dining restaurant well it was supposed to be like a red lobster yeah i know but it, lo it looked like decently nice not bad i uh, and you know it's funny because i feel like people think that oh midwestern re uh, states and stuff which is totally this is a, a stereotype about midwestern states but that they're they would consider a red lobster to be the fancy of the fancy but we're in california here so it's it's interesting that uh the lobster shack is still considered the pinnacle of this suburban town's dining um establishment I think that's just kids, though. Like, yeah. I went to Applebee's and TGI Fridays so much when I was in high school, and I had good food around me. Like, you know, I, yeah. I was I was within a, a stone's throw of a lot of good restaurants, and sure. I was like, "No, nah, man, we're going to get the Fiesta Lime Chicken from Applebee's." 
See they're, you tomorrow. Was that them? <laughs> yeah, Applebee's. See you tomorrow. I guess at that point it was eating good eating in the good. neighborhood. Yeah, it was eating good in the neighborhood <laughs> at that point. Yeah, no, that is very true. There's nothing wrong with a with the trip to the cheesecake factory. I get it. Um, but yeah, so they she the waitress puts down the the lobster and Emma Stone just makes the funniest eye rolling yum face ever <laughs> and I just love that scene I think it is so funny and she's got the lobster bib on um she doesn't take a single bite no. of her dinner though no not at all uh because she sees her former best friend um and doesn't want Rhiannon to know that she's on a date with the boy that she had that Rhiannon had a crush on which is not really Olive's best and brightest move no but i mean olive throughout this movie never claims to be perfect that is true and i love that i love that starting in really the 2000s i would say you get a lot more movies where the protagonists don't need to be these perfect heroes um i i really like that especially within a, kind of a teen movie spectrum i i think that's a good thing to kind of put out there that just because you're the hero of the story doesn't mean that you're a perfect person. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think I, that's I like important that. for, you know, uh, a movie like this, like a teen movie. I think that's, that's a cool idea. That's great. I have I have another one for you. Sure. Um, do you have anything else that is directly tied to this movie? I, uh, not really. Kind of. I just have favorite adult casting or character. Oh, okay. No, yeah, no, that's fine. That'll lead into mine really well. Perfect. So obviously Emma Stone is perfect casting is Olive. We know that. She's wonderful. Um, but... There's a lot of adult roles in this movie played by pretty famous people. I want to know who your favorite either adult character or casting decision was for EZA. Well, my favorite casting decision is Malcolm McDowell as the principal. It's so great. Um, but he wasn't my favorite of the no, of, of the adults. But I just want to give him a shout out because I love him. Um, are we talking my favorite, like my most entertaining or just, best character? Just go with the vibe. Most entertaining is Stanley Tucci. And it's, it's, so funny. it's not particularly close. <laughs> and he goes, the bucket list. I did it. This is the best decision. <laughs> <laughs> Him and Patricia Clarkson are great together yeah. in that they're both like, like, like weird, like free flowy parents. And they like the part where, <laughs> so the adopted brother is black and the rest of the family is white. And he... Stanley Tucci turns to him and he goes, he tells him that he's adopted or what happened? No, he, yeah, he uh, said, the little boy says, oh, well, I'm adopted because it's like, oh, puberty runs late in our family. We're all late right. bloomers. And he says, well, it doesn't matter. I'm adopted. And, and then Stanley, Stanley Tucci, Tucci he goes, turns to him and he goes, what? Who told you? Or <laughs> something like that. And he goes on this whole big thing about how there's no way he could have possibly known that. It's very cute. Um. Yeah, and then you have the the whole uh, bucket list situation where he's trying to choose a movie, and it's between the bucket list and what's the other movie? The other Bolin Girl. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and for they have this weekly movie night where it's a uh, family member of the week gets, gets to, to choose. choose. Yeah, and apparently it turns out that Patricia Clarkson chooses, chooses. every week, and Stanley Tucci is Wins the winner every every week. single week. So he always gets to choose the uh, the family movie. Yeah, it's I a it's a funny little bit, and the two of them are excellent. But Stanley Tucci's the he has the flashier. The flashier lines. He, he's yeah. the most entertaining for me. I, yeah, that's not taking anything away from Lisa Kudrow or Thomas Hayden Church because they're both also I, great. I was going to say Thomas Hayden Church might be my, my you're choice a, there. You're a fan of Thomas Hayden Church. I am a fan of Thomas Hayden Church. He just has the California tone to his voice. Yeah, he talks kind of like this. Kind of like this. But like in an older manly way. I love it. I don't know why. I love it. And he's so good in Sideways. What about uh, Spider-Man 3? I don't know if I've ever seen Spider-Man 3. You've never seen the dancing down the street? I've with seen that scene. With only Tobey that McGuire. scene? That's it. Okay. Well, Thomas Hayden Church plays Sandman in Oh, in well, I'm watching 3. it then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but in this one, I just love the way Thomas Hayden Church, who is like the cool teacher that everybody loves, and he's like really fun and stuff. I love the way he says Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think if he, when he met him like in real life, he said his name like that? I don't know. Is that how he really talks? I think I've, it is because in Sideways he talks like that. Yeah, that is true. I what, think it is. Side, I hope so. Sideways, which also takes place in like a similar area of California. Is that is that close to what? How do you pronounce O J A I? Oh hi. Oh hi. Yes. Okay. Well, there you go. I looked it up. Uh, yeah, I I did not know. Um. So I think Thomas Hayden Church's character is a really great one, and what I really like too is that at the end his story is very unresolved. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah. You have Lisa Kudrow, his wife, who was having an affair with a uh, 21-year-old. 22. 
<laughs> he's, <laughs> like, a, he's like a fifth year senior. senior. <laughs> um, and her, unfortunately, passing an STD to this uh, young man. And when it's all found out, we just have Thomas Hayden Church kind of ignoring her. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Now, we can assume that the marriage is broken up. In fact, Olive does assume that. She says, I ruined a marriage or I broke up a marriage. Homewrecker, she called herself. Homewrecker, the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. But we don't actually know that because the last scene with him is him watching Olive's uh, broadcast. Yeah. And Lisa Kudrow, Mrs. Griffiths, walking past saying his name and he just ignores her. Yeah. And I really thought that the fact that that was unresolved and that this really nice character that was so helpful to Olive doesn't necessarily get this happy ending. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. I think that that sort of thing brings Easy A above a lot of other teen comedies. Because there's slightly more complexity to it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Also, I love Lisa Kudrow. I'm not a big Friends fan, but every single she's time great. I see her in something, whether it's this or or like BoJack Horseman, she's always great in everything that I see her in. We're going to have to watch the comeback. Okay. Apparently, that is like her best work. Okay. I haven't seen it. It's an HBO show. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. I still haven't seen it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So that's my last question. Uh, one last one before the big one, and that is the Mrs. Nesbitt Identity Crisis Award. Yeah, I don't really know. You said you, you have one. Who do you give it to? I, I don't know. I don't I, I know. Would, I would give it to Mrs. Griffith. You would give it to Mrs. Griffith? That would have been one of my top choices. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can look at you could look at Olive too as an obvious one. I mean, yeah, that's uh, you know, always. But I mean, most of the people in this movie are pretty set in who they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, even down to like Marianne. Yeah. Uh, who has a little bit of a moment where she's like crying and whatever, like. Yeah, but it's all selfish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mrs. Griffith, her life is like totally changed in this movie. That is true. Uh, because of her own, like, internal struggles. Because uh, she's not happy in her marriage with Mr. Griffith. And so she turns to this 22-year-old because he's not a minor, she said. And he's like not the sharpest Christian in the Bible, she says. Yes. <laughs> um, and she's just going through it. And she makes a lot of terrible decisions. And she doesn't. She never finds her footing that we see. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's... She's, she, this is definitely an identity crisis. And she's not doing her job very well. She's the Terrible. school counselor. She's the guidance counselor. And she is not helping anybody. No. And when you see Olive going to her, she's very dismissive of her. But it's interesting because they frame her as a good character at first. Yeah, they do. And then she kind of has a heel turn. Yeah. It's really, it's really interesting. But I agree with that. I think that's a good decision for the Miss Nesbitt Identity Crisis Award. Uh, I also think... That it's a good choice because she flip flops. She goes from really feeling sorry, like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did this, to then letting Olive take the blame and then getting angry at yeah. her. It's really interesting, the shift in emotions that she goes through. It's all self-defense. And she justifies her actions sometimes, yeah. which is totally inappropriate to be talking to your high school student about Absolutely. That. Yeah, I think that's an excellent decision. Yeah, and she's also, I wouldn't say the villain of the movie, but she's probably the worst person in the movie. Yeah, yeah, because the other characters... Even like Rhiannon and Marianne, like... Well, they're kids, too. They're yeah. like high schoolers. Yeah, and they don't do anything that's that, like, existentially gutting to somebody else. It's not like... Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it's bullying, but, some of the stuff. But. Yeah, that's true. But Mrs. Griffith, like, like she ruined Mr. Griffith's life for that moment for that time period micah's life olive's life tried almost tried to ruin olive's life she's a terrible person she certainly does not make the best decisions out there that's not to say that every mrs nesbitt identity crisis award winner is a bad person but this one is the casting is also great because lisa kudrow is such a beloved yeah likable likable character with phoebe from friends you know that people know her as yeah uh very congenial and to have her in this role is i think a yeah. really great choice and in also casting. and also i like i said i'm not a huge fan of friends so i'm not like intricately familiar with it but from what i understand she's supposed to be like Sort of like a ditzy, uh, sort uh, I don't know, like nice but kind of dumb character in Friends. That's what I mean. I don't watch. I don't really know Friends too well either. But we were a Seinfeld family growing up. <laughs> but I, yes, I agree. Yeah. So to see her in a role where she's a little bit more conniving, where she has that exterior of being like nice and 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 all that, but she's sort of she's sort of like manipulative and and all that in, in order to 
cover herself up or, or defend herself in some way. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of flipping that typecasting on its head, which was interesting. From what I understand, the comeback is sort of a mix of those two. Okay. So that's, I'm very interested in that. Yeah. There's some movies where they take people like that, that are typecast and other things and they totally flip them. I think a lot, I think Robin Williams did a lot of that when he did, he did. when he did his uh, like serious stuff. Yeah. Like you want to like him in things like insomnia. And I, I don't know. I've never seen one hour photo, but I would think that that was pretty, like he was specifically cast in that role because uh, you know, you know him as the genie and like all that, all, you know, Mrs. Doubtfire and all that. And you totally flip him and it, it adds effect to that character and the way the character comes off on screen. I got one for you. Okay. It's a spoiler alert. For this movie? No, for a different movie, Interstellar. What about it? There's a character in it with, is it Interstellar? Mm. No. Which one? Matt Damon. Oh, yes. yes yeah. Yes. Where, yes. 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 Right? Yes. Isn't that awesome? Yes. He's like, you're like, oh, it's Matt Damon. Oh, great. And, and he's like, like, oh, so no. It's- bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that kind of casting where you give someone who's typecast or who's thought of in one way yeah. and you just completely change a perspective yeah. of them. It would be like That's taking great. it would be like putting Tom Hanks in a movie and then all of a sudden he turns out to be like the big villain. Yeah, exactly. Oh, love that. That's a, such a good point. All right. Yeah, I think that's it other than our other than our final question. Yeah. Which I think this one for me does this go on baby's watch list? Mm-hmm. I think yes, but high school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely high school. Yeah, it was more. There were more curses in it than I remembered. Oh yeah, that was my other thing I wanted to ask you actually, which is um, what's something that you didn't really like as much maybe this time around that you watched? Because I really love this movie, but it already is slightly dated. It is. Um, there was more. Um, I don't think it was purposeful homophobia in this movie but there were there were definitely scenes and moments and quotes where it was like they wouldn't have that in this movie if it came out today well i think that there was an attempt to be uh more progressive in the lgbtq community with this idea of oh just saying it gets better doesn't mean anything right right that we need to work on acceptance as yeah. kids are go- growing up and things like that yeah but you're right there were way too many jokes yeah yeah and like brandon at least in this movie brandon is who's uh olive's olive's gay friend he is a fully fleshed out character him being gay sort of is his identity in this movie, yeah. which isn't where we want to necessarily be. Yeah. I mean, maybe some people think that that's the most important thing to get that as an identity out there. But I don't know. It felt like it was slightly, slightly. It would be a different movie now. Yeah. is basically what I'm getting at. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, there were a couple jokes that made me a little bit uncomfortable. There were no slurs, which is good. Thank God. Uh, we've watched a lot of stuff from the 2000s recently and... It, there were, especially in comedies, a lot more homophobic slurs than I remember. Uh, Homophobic slurs, racist slurs, uh, sexist language, all kinds of stuff in there. Language is totally different now. Very much so. In a positive way. Absolutely. So, yeah, so I agree. I do think that there are some things that do feel a little dated in this movie. Um, But overall, I would definitely put it on my baby's watch list when he's not so much a baby yeah it would have to be high schoolers watch list 16 years old sounds right i think 16 sounds good yeah Yeah. um because at that point we did say like what like 12 for pan's labyrinth or whatever (laughs) it was yeah you know what actually (laughs) that's kind of messed up i feel like that's such an american thing where it's like oh violence oh who cares right but yeah i don't know i i would say maybe I don't know the stuff kids watch nowadays. I got some kids that watch like Euphoria in eighth grade. Oh man! So I don't know. Maybe maybe ninth grade. Eh, we'll see. We'll see. Whatever. But yeah, baby's yeah. first watch list. Heck yeah! <laughs> yeah, love this movie. Yeah. So uh, yet again, we did not pick our next movie that we're going to be doing. Um, I'm not going to do it right now. But <gasps> what I am going to do is this will be the first one where we will put up our poll. Okay. So. If you go to our Instagram page, which by now should be Baby's First Watch List for a while, um, what we're going to do is we're going to pick... I haven't decided if it's going to be two, three, or four movies yet. Probably three. I'm going to put up a poll and of just three movies that we want to talk about or that are on our list or whatever. And 
anyone who follows us is going to be able to vote and that's going to be our sixth episode. So we're going to have it up for, I don't know, maybe a day. Uh, maybe I'll put it back up afterwards, but um, you're going to have to go to at baby's first watch list on Instagram and whatever you guys choose is what we're going to talk about. So they're probably going to be some slightly different, slightly different movies. Uh, I'm not going to make them all like, you know, raunchy comedies or like horror movies, but we kind of want to get you guys input and sort of let us know what you want to see us talk or hear us talk about and, and let us know, you know, always, always feel free to DM us or, or text us or whatever. Cause most of you, again, I don't think we're going to have many viewers that are in our family and friends. So if you are, if you want text us, let us know what you like, dislike all that subscribe. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, make us look good. Make us look like we have friends. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how it's going to work. So keep your eyes peeled for at baby's first watch list on Instagram. Fun. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah, sounds good. I'm going to go put on some hydrocortisone cream. Okay, this is... <laughs> all right. <laughs> the whole house is going to smell like cigar smoke again. <laughs> yep, that's it. All right, bye. <laughs> <laughs> all right, see you guys later. Hello, this is Tom from the future. The future after we recorded this podcast episode, but the past for you listening. Because it would be weird if I was talking from your future, because that's not really possible. Here's how this poll is going to work. Aaron and I would love for all of you, our dear listeners, to choose our next movie. Head on over to at Baby's First Watch List on Instagram tomorrow, Monday, July 11th, where there will be a poll in our story. We went with a theme, and we want you to choose between three classics featuring millennial icon Lindsay Lohan. Your three choices will be The Parent Trap, Freaky Friday, and Mean Girls, three heavy hitters from the Lohan Cinematic Universe. If you do not have Instagram, Feel free to message us on Twitter at Baby's Watch List or text us or send us a carrier pigeon sometime Monday into Tuesday, and we will be sure that all legally cast votes are counted. We will then watch whichever movie you choose and record an episode on it. Also, please feel free to suggest any discussions or questions or comments you'd like to hear us talk about. Okay? Okay. One other thing about this poll. As I record this, it is currently July 8th. Aaron's due date is July 12th, so you do the math. We picked literally the worst possible time to drop this episode and do this poll. But we didn't realize that because we recorded the Easy A episode on June 19th, so I don't know, whatever. It's very possible that for like actual baby reasons, we may not get to this Lindsay Lohan movie for a couple of weeks. Fear not, new episodes are coming regardless. We have spent time recording a handful of episodes as a backlog in case this happened. So whether or not we put out a Lindsay Lohan episode next week, there will be an episode next Sunday and we will push the Lohan watch down the road a bit. But it will happen and we will keep you posted both on next week's movie and when the Lohan watch will occur on our Instagram page. That's all I wanted to tell you guys. So thanks. Thanks.